today on Christian World News, celebrating the coming Messiah. The Old Testament prophets predicted a savior would come. Today, millions of Christians affirm his name is Jesus. We'll look at the biblical texts and the archeological evidence that points to Jesus Christ as the Jewish Messiah and the savior of the world. Welcome everyone to this special Christmas edition of Christian World News. I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, Christmas season is the time we celebrate the coming of Jesus the Messiah. It's an event that Old Testament prophets wrote about hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Today, we take you inside the Holy Land for a special look at how those prophecies were fulfilled, starting with the Christmas story. CBN's Gordon Robertson explains. <laughs> Every day, religious Jews pray for the coming of the Messiah. Traditional Jews believe that in every generation there's a potential Messiah, and that if the generation is worthy, then that Messianic figure will be revealed. There's going to be a son of David, and yet according to the prophecies, greater than David. The Old Testament says the Messiah would be a son of David, born in Bethlehem, called out of Egypt, and raised in Nazareth. He would be a teacher and a healer. He would calm the seas and cleanse the temple. He would be welcomed as a king and yet killed as a criminal. Then three days after his death, he would rise from the dead. These are just a few of the prophecies written about the Messiah. Only one man in history fulfilled them all. If we rightly understand the Hebrew Bible, either Jesus is our Messiah or there can never be a Messiah. There's no question that in the mind of God, he was gonna send a redeemer. His intent for Israel was to be a priestly nation through whom the whole world could be blessed. And it took 2,000 years from Abraham to the coming of the Messiah to prepare a people that could welcome the Messiah. Jesus was born into a world of political upheaval. The Jews had returned from exile to a nation they no longer ruled. During these centuries, the Jewish people began to hear the promises of a son of David and realize it's someone greater. It's not just a regular king. The regular kings have fallen short. They were speaking of this anointed one that would be known as the Messiah. Every prophecy that was spoken about someone from the line of David that was not fulfilled in their lifetime became a potential messianic prophecy. The line of David was no longer in power. Herod the Great was on the throne. And for the first time in history, the Jews had a Gentile king. He had been a convert from the Idumean people to Judaism, and his parentage had no Jewish blood in it at all. Because of his own lowly birth, Herod was threatened by the descendants of David. So he raided the public archives and burned the genealogies of the Jews. Many of David's descendants fled Jerusalem and settled in the village behind me, a place that later became known as the Town of the Branch, referring to the branch of David. Today, we know it better by its Hebrew name, Nazareth. The boyhood home of Jesus, and according to Matthew's gospel, the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy of Isaiah. But the town of Nazareth didn't even exist until about 600 years after Isaiah's time. And at first glance, you won't find the word Nazarene anywhere in Isaiah unless you read it in Hebrew. Matthew brilliantly puts together the voice of several prophets that he'll be the branch, literally the netzer, hence coming from this place, Netzarit, Nazareth. It's a perfect fit, but it's one of these little jewels that Matthew puts there that you have to dig to discover and understand. In point of fact, Messiah was netzer, the branch, the shoot that came up out of the roots of David. In Jesus' day, only about 150 people lived in Nazareth. Once a family of kings, they now worked as farmers and shepherds. 
They recorded their genealogies and kept them hidden. By protecting their family history, they were also tracing the bloodline of the Messiah. Genealogies are important through the whole Bible. It was really important that it was established that the Messiah was from the line of David. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke record the bloodlines of Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary. Both were descendants of David, Joseph through King Solomon, and Mary through David's other son, Nathan. Matthew wants to show the royal descent. He is a direct descendant of King David through his earthly father, his foster father, Joseph. But through his mother, Miriam, better known to Christians as Mary, through his mother, Miriam, he is a blood descendant of David. It was here in Nazareth that the angel Gabriel visited Mary. He told her she would give birth to the Son of God. It was the fulfillment of a birth announcement recorded 700 years earlier in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 7 speaks of the birth of one that's named Emmanuel. Then in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, it speaks of a son of David who's going to be born that's actually called Mighty God. And then Isaiah the 11th chapter speaks of this netzer, this branch, this shoot from the, the root of David. This is the same child, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11. This is the same child who's been born supernaturally. It's quite striking. You have to dig to find it, but when you dig, it's one of those hidden treasures. A royal family in hiding, a virgin with child, and a nation waiting for a redeemer. The stage was set for the most significant birth in the history of the world, Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. Fascinating. Up next, how archaeological discoveries are helping illuminate the biblical account of Christmas. Stay tuned. CWNews.org. Your constant news source on the World Wide Web. Find daily updates on the global church. Watch the weekly broadcast. Three former presidents come together to honor the life and ministry. Also available in podcast. The in-depth insights into our reporter blogs. Taliban kidnapped at least 18 in South Peru, Korean Christians. Your online news source for complete coverage of the global church. Have you ever wondered why some people seem to achieve success so readily? They're able to see opportunities all around themselves. Conquering challenges and achieving success. How is it others are able to overcome destructive behaviors and find true satisfaction in life? And what enables some people to have such faith in God that they see miraculous answers to their prayers? The answer to these questions and how to live a victorious life are found in the secret laws of God's kingdom. In Pat Robertson's latest teaching, The Secret Kingdom, Volume 3, you'll discover powerful keys to unlock the miraculous in your life. As you follow the laws of the secret kingdom and make them a part of your life, the results will be nothing short of incredible. If I could build this big, strong body, this armor around myself, then nobody could hurt me again. I felt like if my mother didn't love me, my biological father didn't love me, then how in the world could anybody else love me? God loves us and he wants the best for us. I'm living proof of that. Just give him a chance. Welcome back. A thousand years before the birth of Jesus, Jewish prophets foretold the coming of the Messiah. Those prophecies are finding support in science. Gordon Robertson takes a look at one archeological discovery and how it changed the course of history. The only people who see the sign in the stars of the night are the people who are looking for it. The ones who saw the sign were the wise men from the east. Their search for the king of the Jews brought them to the palace of Herod the Great. The irony is, of course, that they have seen a star that they associate with the rising of, uh, 
a king over Jacob. So who exactly were the wise men who called on King Herod? And why did they seem to know Jewish prophecy better than the Jews? Well, the answer may lie in a 3,000-year-old inscription discovered in Jordan. In 1967, archaeologists found the remains of an ancient temple in a village called Deir Allah. On the wall of the temple was an inscription about Balaam the prophet, the same character that we know from the book of Numbers. Balaam, the son of Beor, visited by an angel and scolded by a donkey. A freelance prophet hired to curse the nation of Israel, but instead, he prophesied the coming of the Jewish Messiah, the star of Jacob. Only small fragments of the Balaam inscription have survived. It's written in Aramaic, and it talks about fire, terror, and judgment on the land of Canaan. From a deity named Shaddai, one of the Hebrew names for God in the Bible. Balaam's prophecy in the book of Numbers describes a similar judgment on the Canaanites, delivered by the star of Jacob, the Jewish Messiah. Totally different context altogether, an archeological context, with uh, a story about him that is not the biblical story, but it shows us that his reputation as a professional foreteller, prophet, existed throughout the eastern side of the Jordan, what we would call the Transjordan. Balaam is one of the few Old Testament prophets with archeological proof of his existence. I think it's just exciting. It lends plausibility in one sense to Matthew's story because the people who are familiar with Balaam's prophecies are people who are coming from that side of the Jordan River. Balaam's prophecy led the wise men to look for a star, and the star led them first to Jerusalem. This is the Tower of David, the spot where Herod's palace once stood, a place historians called wondrous beyond words. It was here that Herod summoned the wise men to a secret meeting. The humor in the text is that they come to the king of the Jews, Herod, who does not know his own scriptures and has to ask his counselors and his, his advisors to go search the Jewish scriptures so that he can find out which prophecy they're talking about, while they who are Gentiles and foreigners know the prophecy of Balaam. Herod's men found a 700-year-old clue from the prophet Micah, a scripture that led the wise men to the birthplace of the Messiah. They went to Bethlehem and found Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, gifts that were described by the prophets hundreds of years earlier. But while they worshiped Jesus, Herod planned to kill him. Nowadays, if we were to meet Herod the Great, we would consider that he probably suffered from severe paranoia and needed medical treatment and a good psychiatrist. The wise men only fueled his paranoia. They were known as the kingmakers of the East. And now they were in Herod's palace, looking for the one who had been born king of the Jews. Herod saw their visit as a threat. This is just who Herod is. He's a convert with no actual Jewish blood who is um, always fearful, doesn't trust anyone, Loved his wife so much he killed her. Loved her to death, I say. Herod ordered a massacre in Bethlehem. Every male under the age of two was killed, an event that was prophesied by Jeremiah more than 600 years before it happened. Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt, a journey predicted by the prophet Hosea and fulfilled in the Gospel of Matthew. Hosea 11, 1 says, When Israel was a child, and I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Some of the rabbis say Matthew misquoted Hosea 11 terribly. It's nonsense. 
What was his point? His assumption was that his audience would know the whole verse. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. In other words, just as it happened to Israel, so it happened to the Messiah. You have this pattern over and over in the scriptures. Nowhere is the promise of the Messiah more powerful than in the book of Isaiah. He spoke of a child born of a virgin, a son called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The words of Isaiah were copied by scribes, hidden in caves, and protected for more than 2,000 years. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were rediscovered, the book of Isaiah was found completely intact. I would say the one scroll that has had more impact upon the world than any other scroll that was found here is the Great Isaiah Scroll. This is the oldest known copy of the book of Isaiah, and it's the only one we have today that existed before the birth of Christ. There we have a scroll from around 100 BC that is nearly as well preserved as it was in the days it was being read. Otherwise, the next copies of the book of Isaiah come from a thousand years later. And with this, we are going to be able to say now and for all time that we have the text that existed from 2000 years ago. From the desert caves near the Dead Sea to the ruins of an ancient temple in Jordan, the story of the Messiah was etched in stone and written on parchment hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And now the Gentiles can say to Zion, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Coming up, what did the Old Testament prophets say about the Jewish Messiah? And how does Jesus fit the picture? It's the one thing news viewers can agree on. They want change. Now, the world's leading Christian news organization brings you national, international news and analysis throughout the day. Mornings, the busy lunch hour, late afternoon and evenings. It's news with a Christian perspective whenever you want it. Available on the web 24-7 at cbnnews.com. You and I live in a visible world, yet there is at work all around us an invisible kingdom of unlimited goodness and power. In the Bible, Jesus Christ has given us fundamental kingdom principles that are as valid in our world today as the law of gravity. These principles can overcome every obstacle or circumstance we encounter and guarantee our success. In The Secret Kingdom, Volume 3, the final teaching in the inspiring DVD series, Pat Robertson reveals how the power of God's kingdom works and unlocks the secrets of fidelity, miracles, and dominion, powerful principles that will change your life. You can reach from a world of impossibilities into a realm of limitless possibility and power. The Secret Kingdom, Volume 3, available now. I came a slave to it. It got really, really addictive for me. I say, God, you have to deliver me out of this. Of that woman of God laid her hands on me. My God instantly delivered. I didn't have any more feeling to smoke, to use crack cocaine. I didn't want any of that anymore. And if he could change me, he could change anyone. 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah to overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel. But the Old Testament prophets from Moses to Isaiah described a very different kind of Messiah. And only one man in history fit the description. First century Judea was a small province ruled by Rome and ready for a revolution. The Jewish people were ready. 
They had been under Roman rule, and before that under Greek rule, and before that under Persian rule, then Babylonian rule. They were praying for deliverance. They were ready to welcome a Messiah. If someone claimed to be Messiah, they came up and they overthrew the Romans, then everyone would say you're the Messiah. They wanted a political leader. Instead, Jesus came as a miracle worker who reached out to Jews and Gentiles alike. Jesus has to say, rethink your definition of Messiah. In the village of Nazareth, the son of a carpenter stood up in a synagogue and read the words of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives. He gets up and reads from the prophet Isaiah and says, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was saying, I'm the one, just as you thought, just as the scripture said. The people of Nazareth rejected Jesus' claim, just as the prophets had written. It was something that the people were not expecting. There was not an expectation in the Jewish people in Jesus' day that the Messiah was going to die a criminal's death and be rejected. Isaiah said he would be despised and rejected by men. And David said, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Jesus' own family said he was out of his mind. As David had prophesied, he had become a stranger to his own brothers. The Gospels all show that during his earthly ministry, his family did not believe he was the Messiah. It would be very hard for any of us, I think, if we had a sibling grow up with us to suddenly see that person as God's answer for human salvation. Jesus left Nazareth and moved to Capernaum. This fishing village on the Sea of Galilee became the center of Jesus' ministry, just as Isaiah had written. In the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. The prophecy gets even more specific. Isaiah predicted the name of the road that led through Capernaum, the way of the sea. In Isaiah's time, this road was known as the Way of the Philistines. 600 years later, the Romans conquered Judea and gave the road a Latin name, Via Maris, the Way of the Sea. This was the most important trade route in the ancient world. It brought travelers from Asia, Africa, and Europe to the shores of Galilee. This Roman milestone marks the spot where the Via Maris ran through Capernaum. Throughout the ancient city, archaeology tells the story of Jesus, starting with the house of worship. The ruins of this synagogue date to the fourth century after Christ, but underneath, you can still see the foundations of the synagogue where Jesus taught and healed the sick. Here he used a storytelling device that was prophesied in the Psalms. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. It was here that Jesus met the synagogue's ruler and raised his daughter from the dead. Isaiah had prophesied his role as a healer. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Across from the synagogue are the ruins of Simon Peter's house. After Jesus' death, it became a meeting place for his followers, one of the world's first house churches. Here on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus performed two extraordinary miracles. Both were prophesied several times in the Old Testament. The Psalm said he would calm the storm, rule the raging of the sea, still the waves, and walk on the wings of the wind. The book of Job even predicted that he would tread on the waves of the sea. Hundreds of years earlier, Isaiah had written that the Jewish Messiah would also be a light to the Gentiles. The miracles happen and the awareness grows, but he understands himself, first of all, to be sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to the Gentiles as well, but he's just going to focus on Israel. Then Jesus met a Gentile woman who asked him to heal her daughter. She says, Jesus, 
I may be a dog, I may be a Gentile, but can I even just have a crumb? You have so much to give. Now Jesus stops. What this woman says to him arrests him. And he says, this understanding has hit me to the core. Because of this saying, he says, your request is granted. Now he says, because of this saying, the word is rhema. And what is it that she has said to him? She says, Jesus, you may be the Jewish Messiah, and I think you are, but don't you know what God said to Abraham? That through his seed, even the Gentiles would be blessed? Before his death, Jesus left his disciples with a promise. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these. 2,000 years later, that promise is still being fulfilled. Followers of Jesus are healing the sick, raising the dead, and taking his message around the world. A carpenter from Nazareth who basically never left his homeland in his entire life is now the best known name in the entire world. We divide history in the Western world based on his birth. His own people reject him and he goes to be a light to the nations, the ends of the earth. It's all been prophesied. It's all been declared in advance. We created this website as a place where kids can learn the Bible in a whole new way. Kids will love Superbook.tv. They're games, the ability to create your own personal Superbook characters. We even have a place for kids to listen to music on Superbook Radio. Superbook is CBN's animated series that teaches the Bible through the eyes of two friends and their robot sidekick. We're going to tell stories all the way from creation to Christ's return. The website also teaches kids life lessons. Parents can spend time online with their kids learning about the Bible. Superbook and Superbook.tv are entirely gospel-centered, and by supporting it, you'll help bring God's Word to children all over the world. We're reaching a new generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Together, we can give today's kids the truth of the Bible in a fun and exciting way that will change their lives. Visit Superbook.tv today. Daddy? Yeah, buddy? How many nickels are in a dollar? There are 20 nickels Look, in a dollar. How do birds fly? Does milk really make my bones stronger? Yeah, yeah. Daddy? When we die, will we go to heaven? Do you have the answer to life's biggest question? Call the 700 Club. We'll help you find answers to the important questions life brings your way. Christian World News, your window to the global church. For stories of revival. Another revival. Persecution. Funeral, relatives and fellow Christians born in the first country over the international day I'm George Thomas in Baghdad and coming up on the broadcast an exclusive interview. And the impact of Christian leaders. Watch Christian World News. And that's all for our special Christmas edition of Christian World News. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you and may the peace of Christ rule in your heart this Christmas and all year long. Merry Christmas.